Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Justin Zellers, Pepper Geezy, Carmine Bailey. And hey, everybody, we've got two new patrons. Everybody welcome in Ron and Philip. Yay! Ron, Philip, you rock. On this episode of DTNS, the U.S. bans Kaspersky antivirus, SpaceX releases internet for mountain climbers, and will AI chatbots make us less intelligent? I don't know. Let's ask Patrick Norton. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 21st, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. At the edge of the 314, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm producing today's show. I'm Amos. Hi, Amos. Hi. Nice. Um, raise your hand if your hand is covered with very microscopic puppy bites. Oh, it's just me. I uh, can't. I can't. <laughs> today, say, today, can't it's say just that's me. My dear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's it's funny how it feels like a rash. <laughs> but it's, mm-hmm. Yeah. But you can't yeah. see it. It's yeah. just your yeah. hand looks normal. Have, um, have you, you entered have... into the pterodactyl stage of the puppy yet? I feel like, yeah. I feel like maybe uh, uh-huh. uh, Seven the dog being the advanced puppy that he is has, has entered it a little early. So, you know, good good for him. <laughs> uh, Tom, do you have any tattoos? Uh, no, I do not. Not dissimilar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I could get the um, <laughs> tattoos I'll, I'll all over your That's hands. what you should I'd, start doing. Tell people like, eh, it's a tattoo. It's, you know, it's kind I'm, of a millennial thing you wouldn't understand. Trying to figure out how to get ink <laughs> into Seven's teeth now. So we, can... <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. just put it on your hand and let him puncture yeah. it in. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. send it to the subdermis. Yeah. It's a whole business model there. I'd never thought of before. <laughs> all right. Puppy, let's start with tattoos. some technology news oh. in the quick hits. Spotify introduced a new basic streaming plan for users in the U.S. for $10.99 per month, including all of the benefits of a premium plan, but without the monthly audiobook listening time. The launch of the new basic plan comes weeks after Spotify announced the price of its premium plan would increase to $11.99 from $10.99. TikTok filed its briefs in, not boxers, briefs in the U.S. D.C. Circuit Court Thursday, detailing its case for why it believes the U.S. law ordering its sale is a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, And if this confuses you, because TikTok is not a U.S. company, uh, non-U.S. companies, by precedent, have rights under the First Amendment. So that's not even an issue here. An appendix to the filing includes hundreds of pages of communications with the U.S. government over security risks and how to mitigate them. So TikTok trying to show we talked to the government about how we could get around the security risk they're talking about. TikTok already separates U.S. user data from the rest of TikTok by storing it on Oracle servers in Texas and contracting a separate company called USDS to administer that data. A proposal in the filing from 2022 would have given the United States a kill switch to suspend the platform if it violated rules around funding and accessing U.S. user data. All right. This is just the beginning. This is their first filing. It won't be the last information to come out of this case. Oral arguments begin September 16th, and the clock's ticking because the law requires TikTok to divest its U.S. operation or face a ban on its distribution as of January 19th. YouTube is cracking down on people who pay for YouTube premium subscriptions with using a VPN to change their apparent location. YouTube premium is priced cheaper in some regions than it is in others, so if you use a VPN, you can theoretically get a less expensive subscription. YouTube premium is $13.99 per month in the U.S., but the equivalent of $1.54 a month in India. YouTube told TechCrunch, quote, In instances where the sign-up country does not match where the user is accessing YouTube, we're asking members to update their billing information to their uh, current country of residence, end quote. Although some users posted on Reddit that their subscriptions were canceled without warning. I should have thought of this before they figured out how to crack down on it. A vulnerability in Phoenix SecureCore Eufy firmware, that's uh, the firmware that runs at boot up uh, for, to kind of communicate with your chip, uh, is being called Eufy Can Has Buffer Overflow. All one word, all caps with a Z. Uh, it affects several models of Intel CPUs. It is a buffer overflow bug in the firmware's trusted platform module. Actually, it's a 
bug in the way that the Phoenix software accesses the trusted platform mo mo module. Security company Eclipsium found the vulnerability on Lenovo devices first, but confirmed with Phoenix that it affects multiple Intel chip models, so it could affect PCs from Dell, Acer, and HP as well. Lenovo has released a firmware update, so if you have a Lenovo computer, you might want to look for that. Uh, they started releasing those in May to resolve the flaw in more than 150 models, though not all the models have gotten the update yet. So check until you get one. If there is an I can has cheeseburger thing going on, uh, you know, not that uh, this is all good news, but sort of props. Yeah. I yeah, haven't yeah. heard that one in a while. It's a classic. <laughs> it is. Reuter sources say that Amazon's revamped Alexa service, known internally as Banyan, will include a conversational generative AI with two tiers of service. Amazon has reportedly considered a monthly fee of around $5 to access that superior version. This new A is said to be dubbed Remarkable A and is the first major overhaul of the voice assistant since it was introduced back in 2014. <sighs> 10 years ago, along with the Echo line of speakers. I like calling her Al in these situations where you don't want to set her off to. Al. You know. Yeah, yeah. Although sometimes she is, she is an A. Uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce has classified security company Kaspersky Lab as a threat to U.S. national security and added it to an entity list. You may remember that from the Huawei prohibitions. Uh, that prohibits the sale of Kaspersky products in the U.S. without a special license from the department. Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security, or BISA, said that their BIS, not, there's no A, I just added that, BIS, said that the Russian government could exploit Kaspersky to collect sensitive information through administrative privileges. In addition, like most security software, Kaspersky has the ability to install malicious software. Usually you trust your antivirus not to do that, but theoretically it can. Uh, and it could withhold updates to prevent the removal of malicious software if it desired. The ban on Kaspersky in the U.S. takes effect on July 20th. Uh, and software and security updates for existing U.S. customers must stop after September 29th. The idea there is to give customers time to switch and stay secure while they shop around and switch. Uh, Kaspersky, however, plans to fight the ban. Patrick, uh, are you surprised <laughs> that the United States... I know you're not, uh, but what do you make of this ban? Uh, okay, so you and I were talking... Uh, earlier today and and one of the things you pointed out that you know this seems much more rational than the TikTok ban and in fact i you know on some levels i think both well, of us my point being there's no question that kaspersky is a russian company with its right. headquarters in moscow and there is in fact a law in the books that says russia <laughs> gets to intercept communications for national security reasons if it if it so desires right yeah and that's a that's a big deal because i feel i'm using feeling words this is not a statement of fact Got it. please yeah. don't sue me russian government say or it to the stuffed animal Say it to the stuffed animal, um, you know, dear stuffed animal, I feel that, you know, national security is whatever Russian intelligence forces wants it to be at a given time. So, you know, that's that that makes, you know, on a lot of levels, it makes sense to me. Um, you know, I'm kind of curious where this is going to, you know, I, I, I'm kind of curious how much technical interaction there still is. At one point, you know, renting Russian programmers was a really big thing or excuse me, you know, outside contracting to, but this is, it's that law that keeps getting back to me. Like if we need you to do X, you now we could, I'm sure there's someone out there smoothing out the, you know, the, the, the folds in their tinfoil hat right now. It's like, well, we do that in the United States. We just don't make it a public law. It's a private law, but um, it's not really a law then. But yeah, okay, I, get your point. I agree. But you're yeah, yeah. you're proving my point here. Yeah. Um. You know. But it's it's messy, right? Uh. You know. What am I supposed to say? I feel bad for Kaspersky. Um. Well, th that all of my all of the things I, I said I don't about want to sound rude Russia but... uh, and and the law in the books. I'm like th this is very clear. This is not like yeah. TikTok where they've they've gone bending over backwards to not be in China as much as possible while still right. being in China. Uh, there's no law that says they they have to uh, give stuff. It, it's just the unwritten law, like you're talking about people saying about the U.S. in the past. And Kaspersky is out there uncovering actual security threats, many of which are from within Russia. So it's acting 
as if it is not under the thumb of the Russian government. So it's it's curious to me why they went after Kaspersky in particular here. Uh, they are not going after every single uh, Russian company yeah. out there. And Kaspersky seems to be one of the better behaved uh, of the companies that exist on in countries that the United States does not consider its friends. Well, so the U.S. first banned federal agencies from using Kaspersky software in 2017. Correct. So we are, what, six years, seven years out of that? Seven years, Math yeah. is hard. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I wonder, yeah, ha has something happened that may come to light to, to, to kind of bring the momentum back up. There, there was a, a pretty high profile case. We talked about it on DTNS back in January of a contractor for a U.S. intelligence agency uh, having confidential files exfiltrated from their computer. And it appeared that they were targeted because the attackers could see that they had the files based on Kaspersky antivirus. Mm -hmm. There was it was questionable whether they were just using the antivirus like they could use any antivirus to be like, ooh, it looks like the code is there, or if Kaspersky antivirus was constructed in such a way to make it easy for them to see uh, what was on the file. This would imply that at least somebody in the U.S. government is convinced that Kaspersky made it easy for the attackers to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm really curious. I've I've read a number of articles on this, and no one's. I haven't found any that say Kapersky joins, or that you know Kapersky is one of many. It it seems very specific, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's the part that's kind of fascinating to me. Is is that you know is this the first of many? Or did Kapersky do something in particular yeah. that we don't want to talk about? Um, or are enough other companies already under sanctions th that are just generally being applied to Russia that Kaspersky was able to, you know, avoid? Uh, and so you had to go after yeah. them directly and, instead of having them just withdraw on their own. Interesting stuff. Well, SpaceX's Starlink satellite internet service announced the Starlink Mini. It's a compact DC powered satellite dish about the size of a thick laptop, something that you could put in a backpack type thing. It also integrates the Wi-Fi router inside the dish and consumes an average of 20 to 40 watts and can be powered by something like the Anchor portable battery for your phone or tablet. But it does need an external battery. The Starlink Mini costs $600, $100 more than the stationary residential model, and costs $30 a month extra on top of a standard $120 a month subscription with a 50 gigabyte uh, per month data cap. Patrick, we were talking before the show. I know you are a, a, a fan of traveling and a fan of uh, having connectivity while traveling. What do you like and not like about that? Uh, I love the size. The portability is fantastic. The fact that you basically power it off of a USB is going to simplify installation or use in a lot of cases. Um, you know, The Verge has a really nice write-up on this, and they talk about two to three hours from a big... Uh, USB battery power cell, you know, when you get into that sort of 28,000 milliamp hour range, uh, maybe an hour with a 10,000 milliamp uh, battery, which means if, if you, for some reason, want to hike to somewhere and update your selfies immediately in a place where you don't have, uh, you know, a cell phone connection, or if you want to occasionally, you know, bounce updates through the satellites, you know, this has definitely got a possibility in places where you don't have a cell phone. Man, that super that 50 gigabyte cap, uh, and it's a gigabyte, a buck a gigabyte after you hit the 50 gigabyte cap, that really bums me out um, because there are a lot of cases where you can get similar speeds and probably more data <laughs> for less money. I mean, that's, that's, I was super excited right up till I saw that 50 gigabyte cap. Uh, I think we all conceded that any one of us alone, much less a group of people, could blow through that cap in a good weekend of use. Yeah, this um, is not for camping, <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is essentially what that means to me. This is for, uh, I want to power some mapping software while I'm hiking far away from all cell signals, or I want to just be able to check in and text, uh, you know, when I'm taking a break on the trail, or, or you know, like, it, it is definitely not a sit uh, in one place all weekend and stream Netflix uh, kind of a situation. Uh, so it's pretty narrow uh, in, in what it's going to be used for. Although it's only a dollar per gigabyte extra 
over the cap. Oh, so, but yeah. that, oh, that's going to well, rack up real fast. Sure, but they often just cut you off or charge you much more than a dollar per gigabyte. So it's, you know, it, yeah, relatively it, speaking, uh, yeah. not that bad, even if you do go over. But yeah, be careful because if you're streaming Netflix and you go I to mean, 100 I, gigs, I've been on, pretty, you know, you own 50 bucks. You know, in the days before, not everybody has unlimited um, uh, data on their mobile plans now, but uh, I do. But back in the day when I didn't, uh, yeah, going outside of... I don't know, the US or whatever, I was keenly aware of exactly yeah, yeah. how many gigabytes were they being were, used. They were charging you even megabytes kilobyte. at that time. Yeah, megabytes, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, the other so thing is, this you, thing's yeah. kind of heavy. It's not, I mean, when, when you It's 1.1 1. 1 kilograms or 2.43 pounds, right. and then you got to have that battery. If you do that Anchor Prime battery, that's another you know, half a kilogram right there. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of a heavy backpack. When you look at sort of satellite messaging, uh, you know, Garmin many years ago bought Delorme. Garmin now runs the, they're on like the Mini 2, the second uh, evolution mm -hmm. for each. Those do satellite communications. You can do text messaging. You can connect your phone to them um, so that if you want to be able to communicate remotely, that's probably a, a sort of less expensive or less complicated way of doing it. Yeah. I'm actually kind of really curious, is this going to be for people who, you know, are they going to be, do they want to watch a football game from a park where they don't have good cell phone reception? I'm kind of curious what the, the kind of. Yeah. End yeah. Like who's the target about. audience really? Like we're not all hiking all day, every day. Well, some people are, but <laughs> are for there those enough of us of who those aren't, who's going to, to buy yeah. this? Yeah. You know? Well, it's much more um, car friendly, right? Or much more mm -hmm. sort of weekend at the, at the cabin or the beach house friendly than, you know, even the one of the mobile satellites. Yeah. So it, it's that's that that appeal I can see. It's certainly car friendly. And SpaceX made a big point, which they have done in, in Starlink stuff in the past, of saying price is going to come down on this. So yeah, may, we aren't making a lot of these because again, they're not giving us a release date yet. They're just saying uh, we're going to start selling these, which implies they're not making a ton of them. So they're probably fine just selling it to a handful of backpackers who would be really excited about it. Uh, and then as they can make more of them theoretically they would bring those prices down so that it's not uh as expensive to use the internet connection because i don't know that it needs to be that much more expensive right like it's it's a 30 dollars and a cap on top of a regular subscription so that if you're using it at home you don't have the cap um and can you use the portable version at home or do you have to have the separate device to use at home to use your regular internet connection there's a lot of questions there but um if they did bring the price down and and got rid of that cap then we start to see you know a whole whole different situation well every year we try to improve dtns because we do the show for you keep it as our best source of understanding the tech world around all of us we could not do it without you, however. So we need your input. Let us know what you love about the show, what you might change about the show. We have our mid-year survey up at dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Take you just a few minutes. Should be fun and helps us out quite a bit. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. The patrons of this fine show uh, get a, a an episode called The Editor's Desk in their feed. Uh, and that's where I just sit down and answer questions about how the show works or behind the scenes stuff or pretty much anything uh, people want to hear about. Give a little inside look at how we do the show. On this week's Editor's Desk, I addressed an email from Comey asking me if I could keep an eye out for research done on the effect of cognitive decline caused by AI. In other words, any evidence that using chatbots, ChatGPT, Claude, etc., make our make us use our brains less and lead to negative cognitive effects as we age. Now, of course, I promised Comey, like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. I'll keep a lookout for that. It will be a few years before we have enough data usage to create a decent study on this, because you know people have to age while they're using them, and they have to be around long enough for people to age while they're using them. But this builds on the idea that search has made us less intelligent because we don't have to know things, right? There's some people, and I'm not saying Comey is this person, but some people who are saying, you know, that AI is just going to make us dumb. So I did a quick review of the literature, and here are some of the things we found. Sarah, kick us off. 
I will do that. So several studies have found that among millennials, knowing you can look into something like in a search, making you less likely to remember what you looked for in a search. So you can say that search has made it worse at memorizing things. Yeah. All right. Uh, basically, four studies found that when faced with difficult questions, people think about where they can find the answer and have lower rates of recall of the information itself. A UCLA study found that internet searching appears to engage a greater extent of neural circuitry that isn't activated during reading, but only in those with prior internet experience. In other words, searching stimulates complex reasoning, and we use m more of our brain when we're searching. And a study looking to see if searches affected cognitive decline in older people found instead that the kind of searches people do are predictive of early decline in cognitive function. So they didn't find any effect, but they found out that the kinds of search words people use could indicate that they had an issue. So for search, it looks like it's making us worse at remembering facts, but better at complex reasoning. And while it may not do anything to prevent cognitive decline, it might be able to detect it early. Uh, all right, let's switch from that, which is like, all right, this is what people thought about search. This is what the research is finding so far. Patrick, how do you think AI, or what we call AI, chatbots, assistants, et cetera, may or may not be different? You know, I was laughing because what I really want to find out is, did anyone do a definitive study of how we, you know, forgot how to remember phone numbers when we all started putting phone numbers in the cell phones we had around this 24 hours? Oh, totally. Right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was laughing. If, if you type, does blank make you dumber in Google search bar uh, or you know, does blank make you D-U-M-B-E? Don't finish the R. You get a whole bunch of suggestions, right? Alcohol, TikTok, boxing, depression, vaping, nicotine, gaming, music, coffee, stress, at least on my machine. Um, and if you actually finish that search, does blank make you dumber? The number one result is does smoking pot actually make you stupid? Which I found fascinating because that article, uh, which is up on statnews.com, it talked about a recent study that used twins to study marijuana use and its impact on, well, your intelligence, right? Um, to oversimplify, more frequent marijuana use wasn't associated with greater IQ decline, as you'd expect, if marijuana were toxic to brain function. And B, uh, measures of so-called inherent intelligence like problem solving didn't fall on users on some measures like puzzle solving scores actually rose. So, you know, this kind of, in their words, this undermines the idea that marijuana impairs cognition. And to oversimplify even more... The, Basically, what they said was poor life choices are more likely the cause of, quote, low intellectual attainment that you might associate, to use a non-scientific word, with stoners. Um, I mention all that because people as a group tend to suck at differentiating correlation and causality, which brings me back to AI and whether or not it makes us dumber. Um, a lot of the same observations or arguments or rants, whatever you want to call it, they've been applied in recent memory to TikTok, Facebook, not so recent memory, smartphones, uh, screens in general, the internet itself, video games, uh, going farther back before I was born, rock music, novels in the 18th or 19th century, Bibles translated into languages other than Latin, uh, and of course the timeless classical. You can literally find people writing about in Grecian ages and probably complaining about around fires before we had written language is how the younger generation is just dumber or doesn't work hard or any of a number of things we like to apply to mm. those kids. Um, I mean, this feels like the argument that like, well, you shouldn't have a calculator in math class. Well, you it, should it, be it, doing all that on your own. It's funny you should mention that, right? So uh, one of the big uh, furas, one of the big, uh, one of the things that happened back around 2010, uh, Nicholas Carr wrote up a big article, an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal, does the internet make you dumber? And a lot of what it talked about was the issues with the depth of learning versus what they termed the velocity, right? Um, constant distraction is a problem. Constantly changing what you're looking at is a problem. Um, quotes Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist Eric Kandel, quote, only when we pay deep attention to a new piece of information are we able to associate it meaningfully and systematically with knowledge already well established in memory, i.e. constantly, you know, not really going deep on things and constant distractions are a problem. See any of a number of 12 year olds in my experience, right? As their brains ping ponging around, they tend not to kind of remember anything. Um, 
And it's interesting that UCLA study you guys were talking about earlier, um, there's a good quote in there. Internet searching appears to engage a greater extent of neural circuitry that is not activated during reading. And, and it goes in the whole thing about people without prior uh, internet experience. Reading, it's a very passive thing. It's an active consult consumption. Um, but when you're looking for a legitimate answer, or at least the right answer, it involves a lot more reasoning and decision making, especially now when you're, you know, think about how many Google search results are just overwhelmed by low quality SEO answers. And I think having AI summary is that, you know, makes it probably worse. We can get into a whole like, I learned how to do this on TikTok, or I'm going to take the Tide Swallowing Dish Detergent and or Battery Acid Challenge because I saw kids doing it on TikTok. <laughs> this is hyperbole. I'm being humorous. Please don't drink battery acid or don't go look for battery acid. Drink don't drink battery TikTok. acid. Don't, yeah, don't swallow Tide Pods. Those are um, bad for you. Also, yeah. people were doing dumb things before TikTok existed. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's funny, right? But like <laughs> having AI summarize things, I guess it depends on if it's right. And it depends on the whole idea of how we become smarter. Well, the key to how... that UCLA thing was was that we were strategizing when we were searching. So we were we were using our complex reasoning. Right. The argument could be, well, AI is just gonna give us the answer, except so far, and this may change, prompt engineering is a job now because strategizing how to properly prompt the AI uh, engages complex reasoning as well. Maybe that won't bear out, but there's always some unintended thing that we didn't realize that happens, I feel like. I'm not going to argue. Yeah. Well, too bad. Because uh, <laughs> there, there definitely are. I mean, and this is just, you know, a very specific thing in my household, but there are times where I'm sitting in front of a computer, I have, you know, all the tools available right. to me to, you know, fit, get the answer that I want very easily. And I will ask my voice assistant, hey, what's seven times 40? You know, just because I'm like, eh, I don't know. Just, 280. Just tell me. Yeah. Right. You, you know, it's like, this is not hard for me to figure out myself or just know. But sometimes I do feel like, gosh, I was lazy just now. But was I? I got the answer. We can also schedule your lights to go on and off on a routine. Would you like to activate that routine? <laughs> Indeed. It's usually what happens when you ask it a math question, in my experience. But <laughs> I mean, it's interesting um, yeah. when you start reading as you get to a certain age, or I, I have so, a family member that's dealing with, uh, you know, essentially Alzheimer and short-term memory loss. And you start thinking like, wow, am I engaging my brain enough? Should I engage my brain more? Or am I actually stimulating and engaging my brain at a deep enough level to keep, you know, Alzheimer's and or other things uh, as far away as possible <laughs> into the future? So I can see also where for some people, yeah. this is a much more, I mean, Sarah, I'm with you. Like, I think we've all you know, typed a math question into the search bar um, at one point or another rather than writing it down. But I, you know, it's funny, right? You know, do you yeah. get your... It's like your mileage may vary for yeah. sure. Yeah. My, my, my where guess, you are in life and brains and everything. My guess is that we will find that uh, offloading some of the more tedious things may enhance our cognitive abilities and stave sure. off cognitive decline because we can spend more time doing more uh, higher level com complex reasoning things rather than spending a lot of our brain power on the tedious stuff. But, you know, we won't know until we've lived with this for a while. So I will also say if, if AI I mean, doesn't get... Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. If, if AI doesn't get better at finding the right answer in many cases, we're going to spend a lot of intellectual... You know, we're just spent a lot of intellectual energy trying to find out what it should have told us, you know. Yeah, yeah, that too. Um, All right. Speaking of which, let's check out the mailbag. Not that Dan commented on Patreon about our DAC or DAC conversation with Rob DeMillo in yesterday's show on Thursday. Great show, by the way. Uh, uh, not that Dan says, it's good enough all the way for me, it, meaning uh, audio quality. $1,200 to experience the art as it was intended. I spent less on that on my entire living room setup. Most people in my uh, life have a sub $500 TV, use the built-in speakers. It's anecdotal, but I suspect it's unusual to get, clo to get close to the director's version at home. I'm perfectly fine with that. If the story doesn't land for me, no amount of the little details are going to matter. And Jeff wrote in uh, with a, a long, uh, detailed, and excellent review of the Lenovo Yoga, Yoga 7X uh, after one day of using it, because it's a Copilot Plus PC. 
I asked ChatGPT to summarize his email, got the response, sent it to Jeff. That's the step people skip and said, Jeff, I need to summarize it for the show. Does this look good to you? And Jeff wrote back, yeah, it looks great. Thank you very much for asking before just using it. Uh, so here is the summary. Jeff wrote in and said he recently bought a Lenovo Yoga 7X on launch day, drawn in by the battery life claims. The AI features are a bonus, but he mainly wanted something to rival his friend's MacBooks. He likes the build quality and keyboard, and the screen is sharp and vibrant. No major compatibility issues so far, though he had a brief glitch with WSL. He found the co-pilot key a bit confusing since it opens a web page and all AI features seem cloud-based despite claims of local AI capabilities. He appreciated the easy setup, which allowed him to transfer settings from his old laptop, though some apps needed reinstallation. He misses a USB-A port and finds the webcam shutter placement odd. Overall, Jeff is happy with the laptop and impressed with the battery life, which has been fantastic after 24 hours. See, uh, AI, AI works for us after all. You know, when you <laughs> handle it responsibly, <laughs> It can, yeah. 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 And uh, he's, I, I he's like not the crazy whole, like, about Jeff. Do we have your consent? Jeff's like, yeah, looks good. <laughs> he was like, thank you. Some reporters <laughs> have summarized what I told them and didn't ask for my consent, so I appreciated that. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Also, that Copilot key, uh, yeah, it only launches a progressive web app now, uh, so you can't do Windows settings with it. You can't do it in the sidebar. Microsoft has not commented on why they made that change. Well, um, thank you, everybody who writes in. Uh, certainly thank you to Jeff and not that Dan. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your feedback, questions, comments, all the things. Uh, but thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us today. Patrick, when uh, a cat is not scratching your forearms, uh, what are you up to? I... Uh... I am working and raising children, and I'm delighted that I agreed with some of Rob DeMillo's DAC choices yesterday. Uh, if you have a question about uh, DAC or home theater or tech, do me a favor, tweet at Patrick Norton or tweet at Patrick Norton to tell me where I should be in the social media that is not Facebook. Fantastic. Um, uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We love a person who can explain tech and science well, so we're doing a quiz on some of the best. Amos made the quiz today. Stick around. Find out what he'll quiz us with. Just a reminder, we do the show live. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Happy to have you join us live if you can, but we're always on demand as well. We'll be back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one. BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew Jay Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided, provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Justin Robert Young and Patrick Norton, and our guest this week was Rob DeMillo. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>